Hashem, page 169. So it says, the Ramchal elaborates on the providence that Hashem exercises over the creation. He says, we have already prefaced in part one, chapter five, that the uh, beginning of all physical beings is rooted in the transcendent forces, and from them, physical uh, physical beings concatenate, uh, conc concatenate, sorry. Concatenate. concatenate, okay, there you go. Things of a physical nature, with all of their particulars, exist in accordance with what is transferred to them from those transcendent forces down to their specific characteristics. So he says in 11 that the Ramchal explained there how every physical object in this world develops step by step from its spiritual source, like, uh, like the links of a chain. Rav Chaim Friedlander points out that this does not occur naturally. Rather, Hashem controls the entire development as the Ramchal proceeds to explain. Okay, so he says, as such, there is nothing small or large among the physical beings that will not cause that will not find its cause and origin within the transcendent forces corresponding to their characteristics. Hashem oversees all of these matters according to how he created them. He first sees oversees the transcendent forces and then their entire development into physical beings as it is truly meant to be. Similarly, Hashem also oversees the spiritual ministers that He appointed over the physical beings, as we have mentioned there, uh, to maintain them and to maintain their ability to fulfill their assignment and to continuously give them the power that they may implement their works. He says in 18, in addition to the assignment that they are given, Hashem also gives them the ability to carry out the assignment. This is based on the Midrash, which says, There is no blade of grass that does not have a mazal, a heavenly body, if it were, in heaven striking it and saying, Grow. We thus, uh, we thus learn that everything that occurs in the physical world originates in the upper reaches of heaven. It is not simply the result of a natural cause and effect. So here you're having torrential rain here. I'm mean, not like Houston, certainly. But, it's, uh, but what he's saying is that everything starts from the spiritual. And if the truth is, if this thought that he's saying, and it's what we truly believe, but this sometimes gets, this was misunderstood by the idolaters who would pray to the rain god and all these other gods. They said, since it's part of uh, following Maimonides' model, since they are officers of God, so I have to show them respect, but ultimately they become the, the god themselves that they're praying to. And that's why the, uh, I don't know, when the Indians would do the rain dance, or what the famed rain dance, I don't know if they actually did it, but if they were doing that, who were they praying to? Were they praying to the God of rain? Were they praying to the nature of rain? I don't know. But the point is that everything, their concept is true. Everything starts spiritually. That's a true concept. Everything starts in the spiritual world with your mazal, with your what, whatever constellation planet you were born under. That has power according to us it's not does it have the power that they make it in the in the newspapers here's your daily horoscope that's a bunch of trash let's understand that's trash we don't hold by that but to say that there's no influence from the stars or the celestial bodies that god created over us that's not true we do believe that there's something we also believe that god can override everything so it's, yes, they're out there, those forces that God put into place are out there. Anytime God wants, he can flip them on his head and say, not today. But that's, we have to recognize that and we have to turn to God and not, and not be uh, saying, oh, this is just fate. This is whatever God wants. Be passive about it. You have to be active. There has to be a destiny there. That's, what, that's the point here. Okay, so that's, he, but he's saying, in general, there is, these uh, maz mazalot, again, for whatever, however you want to translate that, constellations or spiritual forces that do have an impact here. And it starts from there and it's coming down. 
what we call the trickle down trickle down spirituality to economics. Okay. So uh, that was eighteen. Okay. So the Ramchal explains how Hashem's providence over man is different. So that was the galaxies. Fine. So now here we go. Since the species of man differs from all other species, for he was given free will, along with the ability to acquire perfection or shortcomings. So this is, again, I want to go through this slowly here. It says, man's free will is limited to the acquisition of perfection or shortcomings. That's what we're limited to. The, this is based on the Gemara that says, all is in the hands of heaven except for the fear of heaven. Everything that occurs, everything else that occurs to a person is divinely decreed. So again, if I'm getting stuck in traffic, if I'm living in the, I'm going to, what was in Michigan? Uh, you had uh, Pat Robinson, I guess. He got into trouble for this. There was, uh, there was a tornado who went through a, uh, there was a tornado area. So it ripped up, some, I guess, Oklahoma or something. I forget what it was, a couple of years ago. And uh, so he came out and said, they misquoted him actually, because I heard the whole quote and <laughs> it wasn't as stupid as they made it out. <laughs> but <laughs> he, wa he was basically saying it's that God brought it upon them. That was what they got. The, the outtake was God brought it upon these people. So they said, what kind of nonsense, you know, the blaming power off. If you listen to the whole quote, he said that, it's true that God brings these things to us, the tornadoes and so on and so forth. But he, he, you know where the tornado path is. Who tells you to put yourself into danger? That was the whole quote. <laughs> so we're told, he said, God killed his people and that's the end of it. That was the headline. But again, if you listen to the whole quote, he didn't say that. Now, I don't, I'm not one of his fans anyway. I don't really don't care what he says. But... There, there's, again, there was a bit of truth to that. God's running the show. Now, if I see that there's a danger going on there, I shouldn't go. If I know that, uh, for instance, if I'm going to go to California, I shouldn't just live on top of the Andre St. Andreas Fault and wonder why my house is falling apart every couple of days. It's not a smart thing to do. Okay, you have to use God-given brain. If I'm going to uh, have a mansion in the forest of California, which is always under drought conditions. Mm -hmm. And every year they have a major forest fire. And every year, thousands of millions of dollars are destroyed. Again, there's not a place to settle. You use your God given brains. Okay? So it's true, God brought all of this. I'm not going to deny it. I'm not going to say God didn't do it. No, God does everything there. God's running the show. But at the same time, we have to react properly. We have that free will to do what, to stay out of danger or whatever the case is going to be. I'm not saying, I'm not condemning anybody. I don't want this to go uh, viral, although it will go, they'll just say out my words. But if it goes, oh, I'm, it won't be so bad to be viral, okay. <laughs> go for it, go viral. Everybody will know me. Maybe they'll come and <laughs> come to our class. Sorry? Louisiana. When you build your home under sea level. Right. Same sort of thing. Right. Yeah. Okay. But there, uh, but I'm just saying Hashem brings all this. No question. I'm not going to take it out of God's hands. God does it. Like I said, we have to realize am I putting myself into a no-win situation and then going to blame God for it. That's not a good thing either. I have to know. So that's what you're saying. We have the ability with our free will to acquire perfection or shortcomings. And again, we're going to go... We'll, be explaining what these things are. And therefore, from this aspect of man, he acts and affects others and is not merely acted upon. It's not everything's just hap I happened, it's all happening to me. No, again, you have free will there. Consequently, the nature of divine providence over him must also differ from the nature of divine providence over other species. And he says in 21, obviously, the nature of Hashgacha, of the supervision that God has over a person whose free will decisions influence the entire world, including the spiritual realms, 
has to be more encompassing than the hashgacha over a creature that has no ability to make independent decisions at all, and therefore no such influence. My dog, the, uh, the dog, cat, uh, ducks, they go in my pool, they mess me up. They are the frogs who, who killed generations. They don't, they, they have no free will to do it. They see, I, this tree, I don't understand how tree frogs do this. You hear them all night, and suddenly you see them in the pool. Did they fall down? Did they jump? I don't know. It's always something that bothered me. How do you do that? But nonetheless, first there's none, then there's, you have a whole generation. <laughs> what are you doing? Get out of that pool. But all those things, they, God, you know, if that would be a human who would be doing that, falling to your death, I think I would tell him you're an idiot. But a frog is a frog. I can't do it. A duck is a duck. They, they see a little water, they descend. They, get, they start swinging around. That's all. But a human would not be stupid enough to walk on top of something he's going to fall into. <clears throat> Hopefully, anyway. Some of them are. Some of them are idiots, there's no question. But we, uh, we can't make everything idiot proof no matter how much we try. But again, that's his free choice. The guy who climbs all these mountains because they're there or skis down uh, dangerous places because he can't. I'm looking and saying, why would you do that? Why would you want to do that? I mean, for the thrill of it? I don't get it. And I was watching uh, on YouTube, there was somebody who jumped out and it was flying through the air. He's going down. He's not, he's not just a man. He's, he's going down. And I'm thinking, is he nuts? He's not pulling it. I didn't know he had a parachute on. And when he gets really low, so Pulls the parachute. Okay, you have thrill seekers. For me, that's idiotic, but I wouldn't jump out of a plane unless I have to anyway. <laughs> yeah, you jumped out. You were par no? No. Okay. Ari has one, but I don't. Uh, I remember when my father was in the armed forces, so they, uh, that was in the uh, the old days, and going back to Korean wars. So they had to, you had it for, for the army, for some reason, they had they took you up in the airplane because they want you to know how to parachute. So, but they don't give you a choice here. <laughs> they push you out, and they're uh, and the uh, you go down disconnected, so the parachute opens. <laughs> my father said, "I did my job, and I never went up again." <laughs> he said that was the scariest thing he ever did. You can feel falling at 15 miles an hour. And you have to know how to fall right. I mean, you can break your legs and that sort of thing. Or when they do that bungee jumping? They didn't have that. Did they have those just days? I'm just, oh. Yeah, this, now they jump all with their big Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> Again, the uh, thrill seekers, you're, if that's, you, we weren't made to do that. We were made to serve God, not to put ourselves into danger. And so they would argue it's not danger. I'm not going to argue against everybody's foolishness. But it's, for me, I, I, I don't get it. But it's uh, because the airplane might crash for the bungee drop. No, that's why they parachute. Because no, 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 I understand why they had a parachute. I understand why they had a parachute. But I'm saying, at least when my father jumped out, the parachute was quick. It wasn't that he had it, they didn't trust them to they, pull they the didn't car. No. Right? They didn't trust them. <laughs> but these guys free fall, and you're thinking, oh, the Michigan, the rich guy who went into space. And he fell out to, he wanted to go, jump. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Michigan, I was thinking, you're an idiot. <laughs> he fell out, I never seen that. Yeah, he falls out, he's in space. <laughs> he falls down. Fall. Yeah, yeah, he falls, and he's going, he passed out. Just for a moment. For a moment, but the guy's an idiot. Uh, you're rich and you have nothing else to do with your life. Give me money. I'll take your money away from you. Leave me alone, you don't deserve the money. Leave me alone, yeah, yeah. such idiots. I don't even know his name, but if I I would even put his name on the internet. It was, uh, Branson. 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 Okay. Uh, no. It? No. Who was it? The guy who jumped. Uh, I want to say he was somebody from Europe. The yeah, but jumped. didn't Branson sponsor it? it was yeah. Oh, no, no, yeah. I don't care who sponsored. I don't care who sponsored. It. It uh, if I can get any idiot to jump on, this is their problem. Red Bull and some, yeah. somebody commented at the time. You know your nation's in decline when a beverage company has a better space program than your government. There you go. <laughs> okay. But that's what I'm saying. That's free. He had his free will. He jumped and he uses free will to jump out and be an idiot. I, I can't help that. Okay, but that's 
So we need what the Ramchal is saying is we need more Ashgacha from Hashem. We need, we need more supervision from Hashem than the, the, the rock or the bird that doesn't need that much. Look, you're operational. I, I gave you your marching orders, you do it. So you don't need that much supervision. But when it comes to every, when it comes to us, it's a full time job. <laughs> and that's why that's what he's saying. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so then he says, so, um, oh, so uh, yeah. So next page. So Hashem needs to oversee and survey all of man's specific actions, and he says. Now he makes a distinction here. That the Mare Derech suggests that to that to oversee Lashgiach refers to inspecting be, uh, beneficently, while to survey the Hashkif refers to looking in a negative way. So two Hebrew terms he's talking about there. So again, survey is a negative and oversee is positive. So Hashem needs to oversee and survey all of man's specific actions to provide for him according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds. And he says this is based on the verse on the Pasuk in Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, where it says, I, Hashem, examine the heart and probe the thoughts to give to man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds. Hashem reacts to man's thoughts, his ways, and to his actions, the fruit of his deeds. Uh, the Ramchal stated above that even the thoughts of man affect the spiritual sources of the world. Again, as long as it's just thought, but I don't bring it into action, I won't be punished. But it doesn't mean that the thoughts don't do anything. Thoughts do things. Since man's thoughts and actions affect the rest of creation, Hashem has to ensure that those efforts are all actualized in, in, uh, in all their details. So he says, he continues, consequently, all of man's actions are overseen along with their consequences in order for those actions to take effect. And he says, this is, the, uh, this is thus, the first way in which Hashgacha, overseeing over man, differs from that of the rest of creation. The Hashgacha over man includes the implementation of all the consequences of man's decisions. Whether the Hashgacha over the rest of creation, whereas, I'm sorry, whereas the Hashgacha over the rest of creation does not include any such implementation, but rather it merely ensures the continued ex existence of the species. I don't have to do much for the dogs and the cats and the fish of the world. They'll continue on. Again, there's no free, they're not committing suicide, they're not jumping, bungee jumping, they're not jumping a free fall, they're not doing crazy things. They're not climbing the Himalayas because they're there. It's something that we're the only creatures that can do that foolishness. A, a, a horse, if you realize you're going to die, will stop. We'll keep jumping. <laughs> it, should, it should be noted that at this point, the Ramchal refers only to ensuring that man's decisions take effect. He has not yet mentioned Hashem's reward and punishment for man's correct or incorrect decisions, or Hashem's Hashgacha to bring about his planned perfection of the world. Okay? Hashem will further oversee him as is befitting the results of those specific actions. Uh, and it will be executed measure for measure, as will be explained further on. She says in 26, the Ramchal does not use the phrase measure for measure until part four, where he discusses the mitzvah of shofar. The shofar is the ram's horn. However, the entire next chapter teaches us about Hashem's system of reward and punishment in response to the thoughts and actions of man, and it is safe to assume that this is what the Ramchal is referring to here. The Ramchal, in Taz Tavunot, the Ramchal explains that the response of measure for measure is a result of man's having free will. Hashem established from the outset that he would react correspondingly to every decision that a person implements through his free will. The Ramchal has now supplied two reasons why the Hashgacha of a man differs from that over the creatures. The first one is man's free will decisions have an effect on the world unlike other creatures. Hashem has to therefore ensure that every thought and action he makes with its consequence take effect. By the way, I'm going to stop here for one second. Why would my thoughts mean so much? 
Again, if I don't bring it to action, what's the problem? How's it affecting anything? Yeah, I don't see any problem with that if you don't bring it into action either. So, so but we're still held accountable for that, right? Uh, oh, I, we're, again, we're not. No, we're not held responsible by this court, uh, by heavenly court, uh, by the the court down here. Certainly, it's only Hashem who understands from those thoughts things can happen. He has to be vigilant over that. But I'm saying, why? I want to be logical with this too. I'm not even getting spiritual here, just logically. What happens? I have, I'm speaking to my, to you, my, my minions here, okay? And what happens is, I have a particular bent on something. I'm not going to do it. But you're, you're hearing it. You're influenced by my words. My kids are influenced by my words. They'll action it out. They may actually action it out, right. So, I never did anything. What, what's his name? The, the Michigan, uh, we have a lot of Michigans in the world. But the guy, the mass murderer, he never killed anybody. Charles mass, Manson. Charles Manson never killed anybody. But he, he, he got people to kill. Or Jimmy, Jimmy, the, drink the Kool-Aid. Who was that? Jones. Jimmy Jones. Okay? He got people to buy into the stupidity. I, I don't understand people. Okay? But that's what happens. The thoughts become actions at that point. So I didn't do anything. I'm innocent. I didn't do anything. God, what do you want from me? I said something. I thought something. And if I thought something and somebody overheard me, if you will, they understood from the way I said it that that wasn't his real intention. He meant this. And so they start reading my mind. Or whatever the case is going to be. My thoughts can turn into act, somebody else's actions or ultimately my own. Yeah, but like you said, you, um, you shouldn't be held accountable for that. The idiot went and shot him because you, you know, you said something about it. That's his fault. Oh uh, no! Again, on the, in this world, he's he's held accountable, not me. On this world, clearly, he, he you are, we have in Adam Chay below below uh, in Adam Chay below. Uh, no man sins if it's not for himself. We all do it for ourselves. So I can't force you to sin. That's an impossibility. That's why you're responsible for what you do. In other words, if I give you marching, if I tell you, kill blah, blah, and you go out and kill blah, blah, uh, it's not my problem. It's yours. The government may think differently about that, but nonetheless, I'm not the hit man. You're, you are. You killed the person, not me. I Even though I gave you money, who cares? You're sinning on your behalf, not on my behalf. So how does the Lord deal with that? Uh, again, God has his own divine judgment. But I'm saying on this planet, mm -hmm. with our court systems, we can't punish the guy who sinned because you convinced because he was helping you out, if you will. Well, that's yeah. accessory. There actually is. Okay. <laughs> actually okay. No, it's okay. So not, not, think of the Alfred Hitchcock killer, which became the comedy Throw Mama from the Train. That, that sort of thing where they were going to exchange murders. I'll kill your wife, you kill my mother, and whatever it's going to be, okay? So what happens is one actually does it, but the other one chickens out. Well, you can't get me for it. I didn't do it in the end. I didn't do it. You did it. You're going to go to jail. I can't do anything about that. But uh, so on this planet, again, we can't do it. It's not necessary. It was a trade-off. <laughs> It's not an accessory. You can't get me for accessory. Accessory, maybe because I paid you. You can get me. But if I if I said, wouldn't it be nice if you killed so and so? And you went, <clears throat> I just said it would be nice. I didn't I didn't say do it. But you heard me. Oh, I really wanted. You can't claim this accessory. So again, was I guilty? Yeah. I, I mean, I got the poor guy to kill somebody. Or whatever. Because I, I suggested it to him. And the guy said, what? Not a bad idea. <laughs> Take him out. But uh, it wants to protect me. But it, again, on this planet, in these courts, in the Jewish court, I can only get one. I can't get the other. God can, God will get you. No question. And that's why it says that for the thought, Hashem sees the, the, uh, the outcome of these thoughts. And that's why he has to, as it, as it were, work overtime to be watching over us. Because he's, and he's, he does hold us accountable for those thoughts. Because they could come to fruition at one point. But again, he'll never do it for this planet. You can't get me for thoughts here. 
but if it's, it will affect everything else. And if I, again, depending on how I talk or think or act, could affect my grandchildren. I may have been the greatest righteous person in the world as far as you're concerned. And my kids may have been, but I passed that poison on. And so that my grandchild becomes the poisoned fruit and he acts on it. So then I get punished backwards. Okay, that's, by the way, that's when the Torah says, you'll be punished for the third and fourth generation. That's what it means. It means that if I did something and I passed that on and my kids picked it up and they passed it, so you have four generations basically before God says, enough is enough. You all had free will to say, no, this is wrong. You have enough information out there. But if you don't and you keep thinking, well, my father got with it, so and so forth, and, I, and he was a righteous person, no, if I have those thoughts that I, there was something wrong with me, the fact that, that I could carry out a, in actuality that I'm following all these laws, but I, for some reason, believe that it's all foolishness. And again, that gets passed down. So if that gets passed down, that bad thought is going to ultimately end up ruining the system. So sooner or later, the other, somebody, two, three generations later, is going to want to walk away. I'm held responsible for that because I should have realized that and I should have cleaned my mind out. I should have said to myself, if I really believe that, isn't it time to get help? Isn't it time to check out, you know, what's going on, ask questions? People don't have to ask questions because they're afraid of what people, this is my take, they're afraid of what people will think about them. In other words, if you would ask a question to me and, and you're afraid of, not of the answer I'm about to give, but I, if I ask this to the rabbi, he's going to think this of me. I don't want him to think that of me, so I'm not going to ask him the question. I'll just listen, nod my head, and I'll believe what I believe. You haven't accomplished much. Rather, be called a heretic and find out why you're a heretic. You know, of if you're uh, rather be called a wicked person and say, why, why am I wicked? Why is this bad? Okay, now we have a real conversation going on. Now you're really in church mode. Now you're really trying to do what God wants. That God says, Kola kavod, all the honor to you. That's what I want to see. I want to see the work. What God doesn't want to see, again, following this, I'm not reading God's minds here. What, what, what uh, quote unquote mind, okay? What God does not want to see based upon this is our just accepting or not asking, not trying to figure things out. No, I want you to figure things out. That's my, your free will. What's going to happen is going to happen. Again, you have no control over the rain, over this, over that. You have no control. I'm going to do certain things to you and you're going to have to respond. Hopefully you'll respond right. And if you do, you'll grow. If you don't, you'll go down. It's as simple as that. But you have to know that. And again, those questions that you have, you have to ask. You have to struggle with yourself. You have to get the words right. And then you grow. So that's what you're saying. That's Sorry? That's why we're here. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so let's go on. Uh, that was 26. All right. So it says, this is something that is not relevant to the other species whose members are acted upon without being active participants. And he says, therefore, there's no need to oversee their, their thoughts or actions since they have no independent effect and since they do not relate to good or bad, no reward or punishment is possible. So he said, and are, so again, whose members are acted upon without being active participants and are only there as much as is worthwhile for the fulfillment of that species as has been embedded in the roots. And again, he says in 28, Thus, the hashgacha over them is needed only to maintain them. As Ramchal explained at the beginning of the chapter, remember, God's keeping them alive, keeping the species going. In Das Tevunot, the Ramchal writes that from the perspective of hashgacha concerning the maintenance of this world, no difference is made between the different species or different members of the same species. The largest star needs the same maintenance from Hashem as the smallest gnat. That's an amazing statement. Think about that. The largest star, smallest gnat, same energy, if you will. For us, 
Oh, a whole different ball game. But for that, it's nothing. It's okay. Sitte Chayim explains that one cannot even say that the sun is more important than the gnat because they are both equally necessary for the goal of creation. So back to the text. It says, For the nature of divine providence is such that it maintains that root and its branches according to what the nature <coughs> and the law of the root requires for its existence. And it says in 30, the characteristics of a physical being are reflective in its spiritual roots and as such are defined by the spiritual roots. As mentioned previously, the Ramchal writes in Marma Ikarim that nevertheless, Hashem's Hashgacha is over every member of, of each species regarding its effect on the species as a whole. The, uh, thus, although Hashem is certainly aware of every minute detail that happens anywhere in creation, His providence applies only to what is necessary to maintain that species in existence. So again, God is not really interested if a particular cow is going to live or die. He just has to keep a, a lo- uh, the species alive. So uh, we're not looking as why was that animal a, a subject of roadkill? Happens. Cross the street. That was fast. Had to hit. The question is, are you going to hit your brakes? Do you care about creation? All these wonderful things. And actually, there's not two questions. If I'm on the highway, and it's a, I'm not talking about deer, because if you hit deer or a, or a, a moose, you're dead. <laughs> So, and they'll just shake their head and walk away. Okay, the deer maybe it won't, but the, the moose they look at me and say, "Are you an idiot?" <laughs> There's but, a trick to hitting them. But the trick to hitting them. Okay, well, <laughs> let's not put that on the internet. Okay, uh, but it, the point is that these animals that will make their walk, it could be that God's bringing them there for to see how you're going to react. I'm not going to take that out of the picture, but whether or not that particular animal lives or die that we talked about before, is not going to change creation. It's it was uh, as long as the species doesn't disappear. That God said it was good. Again, that's the other part because you have species that disappear. God only keeps them around for when they're useful. Once they're not useful anymore, they disappear. God didn't say you were because. I brought you, I created you, that you'll never disappear. So only those certain animals will never disappear. Which answers the whole question on extinction. How can certain things disappear? Because God didn't say, and it was good for the particular animal. That's all. Simple answer. They weren't necessary anymore. Not necessary. Get rid of it. Bye. It's like uh, when we had the Industrial Revolution. We lost a lot of work, lost a lot of jobs. Computers, a lot more jobs. At that point, you, you don't say, ah, the good old days when I had all these jobs. Buy, get something new. That's what it is, progression. You can't cry about it. You could cry about it, but it's not going to do anything. You're not going to do anything with it, right? So that's what he's saying here. When it comes to these sort of things, we have to keep that in mind when we're looking. Because that's one of the things, by the way, that people will always argue. God, if, there's such, if God is God and he created the animals and so on and so forth, so how could it be extinction? It's an idiotic question. It doesn't, the question doesn't begin. Because they're arguing, if God created it, then it must have a reason, and it has a reason, so it must be forever. I don't know why. I mean, we all, when we have kids, we, we're parents, fine, and we'll be parents for the rest of our lives, but at a certain time, the kids grow up, and they no longer need to change their diapers. We may, have to, we may have to change it in a different manner sometimes, but again, your your mo, your method of training your children changes very quickly when they start growing up, and when they actually go off to college or just get married, you've lost a lot of influence there. So what are you supposed to do? It doesn't mean you're no longer the parent. It means your your role has changed. That's all. That one role has become extinct. You should be happy for that. I look forward to when my kids are out and married and have kids. I look forward to that. I also dread it. It means I'm getting old. Who needs that, you know? It means that things, life goes on. It means I'm on the other side of that. I don't, I don't want to think that, but again, I look forward to it too. I 
looking forward to dancing the kids' weddings and seeing the bar mitzvahs and the kids and, and seeing my grandchildren get married. I'm going for the long life at this point. Okay. God, I told God, he, I'm waiting for that. He, he can't, I want to be here for the Mashiach, so I have a long time to go. <laughs> 120 years and nine days. Because <laughs> yeah, I don't want to be scared. You don't want to death. die suddenly, right? I don't want to die suddenly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so that was thirty. Okay. So, however, the species of man whose members act and affect the creation, as we have mentioned, must be overseen in detail, uh, especially exactly according to the causative nature of their actions upon them. Nevertheless, no more. We'll further elucidate this uh, on this topic further on with the help of heaven. He says in 32, and we'll stop here. Thus, humans are subject to Hashgacha Pratis, meaning that Hashem oversees and responds to every minute detail in every person's thoughts or actions. By the way, if you really want to be scared, now you're scared. When you think God is the overseer, the manager, if you will, the boss, doesn't really care about what you're doing privately, all your thoughts. You were a little uh, better off. But we're telling you, he's telling us, uh, reality is God cares about every single thing that we do. And every single thing that we think. So don't ever think, in your imagination, that God's not watching. You're never alone. Your thoughts are never yours alone. Control yourself. That's what he's saying to us. Really strong message. Uh, in Das Tavuna, he, the Ramchal calls this the Hashgach Aham Mishpatis, the uh, judgment, because Hashem weighs each act for the reward or punishment due, depending on upon the nature <coughs> of the particular act. Whether this uh, applies to all mankind or just to, to the Jewish people, will be discussed. So you may get a way out, you may not, but that we'll have to see. But right now, I would start thinking very carefully, what should I be thinking this? Again, the best reason for not thinking it is because you may infect somebody with that thought, just simply without push, push the reward punishment out of here. Your thoughts can affect a lot of things because you may not say it, but I'm going to get it from you. If I speak long enough to you, I'm really going to know what you think. It's not hard. By your actions. By your actions and by your attitude. Mm -hmm. If I talk to you attitudinally, I'm going to know what you think. So I'm going to, for the most part. And even though you didn't say it, from your look in your face, I'm going to know something's wrong. That's why when you go into your house, you see your beautiful wife, what happens, you say, and when all the joking of Sada that we don't know how to communicate with our wives, you say, how are you doing? She says, all right. And your first response is, what's wrong? Now, if she's not in the mood to torture you, she'll actually tell you what's wrong. Okay? Instead of saying, you should know what's wrong. Okay? But really, it's, it's this, we know when the other person, even though they say, I'm fine, you're really not. So what's wrong? My back hurts. Okay. But you already know it. Even though they said, I'm fine. You're not fine. And you just want me to ask you fine, so I'm asking you. But that's, you really get to know it because you know the person and you care about the person. So imagine Hashem cares, so, loves us so much that He's saying, I want to train you that you can't think these thoughts. It's dangerous to you. It's going to hurt you. It can hurt others, certainly. But it can hurt you. So don't do that. Okay, we'll have to stop here.